a wonderful conversation after Daquan speaks um, will be an inspiration to you. So after Daquan speaks, I'll say a little bit more about Steve and what he brings to this conversation as well. So help me welcome Daquan. All right, I've got some range. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I was seven, my mother told me I couldn't have a toy. And so like all seven-year-olds, I was upset, but still determined. I grabbed a stack of newspapers and sold them to anyone I saw for any amount that they would pay. Now, if you're thinking that they only bought it for me because I'm just a cute little kid trying to sell newspapers, you're probably right. But I still made enough to purchase my toy. Fast forward high school, senior year, I'm selling Pop-Tarts, um, and earning about $250 a week, roughly $1,000 a month. That allowed me to purchase things like new clothes, um, even a new cell phone. And I did this because coming from a single parent, low income household, that kind of extra initiative was exactly what it took if I was going to keep up with my peers. For individuals born within under-resourced communities and households, we're consistently provided with lesser quality opportunities, lesser quality resources, and lesser quality education. And society tells us things like we need mentors and hard work and perseverance to achieve success, but rarely at all will you find someone who, teach, um, who taught us how to find our own mentors and that hard work and perseverance were skills which meant they needed to be practiced like all other skills and not just this abstract concept, work hard. Um, Quick show, quick show of hands. Does, any, does anyone know here, um, if you were a young basketball player, how would you become a great basketball player? Practice. Practice, yes, thank you. <laughs> if you were an artist trying to become a great artist, does anyone know here how you might become great at that thing? Practice. Yes, <laughs> thank you. And so the common, there's a common theme here um, in that that, that practice, that practice field is exactly what we provide at We Thrive using project-based learning and mentorship. All of our, so our program is an undergraduate university students leading middle school and high school youth through the creation of a business venture where they're being mentored and taught critical life skills along the way. We're using that entrepreneurial practice field to give our students the chance to learn, learn things like how do you fail and fail forward, how do you use, and then for example, we use a startup as a practice field to say, all right, group of eighth graders, they don't know everything yet about creating a business, but who might? And actually walk our students through who might be an ideal mentor for what I wanna know, and go through the experience of reaching out to local professionals to find their very own mentor. Right? So mentorship is one thing which we use to show them this is what a positive near-peer mentor specifically looks like within our college student, but then also teach them this is how you go and do that after this. Specifically, within our model, we are an after-school program running 90 minutes once a week. We do bridge over the course of an academic school year broken down into two different stages. The first stage is launch, where our students are doing everything from understanding the target markets to their brand positioning statements, going forth to speak and communicate with suppliers all on their own, ultimately bringing their product or service into market. Second stage is all about growth. Within growth and management, they're actually going through the process of understanding what are the sales channels we're going to explore and other concrete, um, full-fledged functions of creating that company, all to teach them and give them, again, the hands-on practice of things like collaboration skills, things like how to go ahead and have that critical thinking of this is what's going to work for my target market and not, and allowing them that space to fail. Our college students themselves are trained that the students themselves will make their own decisions, and even if they happen to make their own decision that doesn't work, that is also entrepreneurship. And so by no means can us as a program or any entity protect an entrepreneur from failure, but in that failure, what does it mean to pick yourself up and think forward, um, again, that habit adoption and that practice. In a typical day in We Thought Programming, our core is always within the mentorship, which is why we operate through near-peer mentors, sorry, which is why we operate through college students. But even deeper and just as important are the support systems that we also forge within the program intentionally. 
No student within our program will ever create a company by themselves. We do have our students create companies and up to five students. That allows us the perfect situation to teach our students things like leadership and teamwork, but also what a positive support system looks like and also what our role within a positive support system can look like as well with intentional exercises week by week. Um, within our instructional piece, our, student, our college students will teach our middle school students and high school students the particular lesson of the day, something like how to find and build mentors that I explained earlier, and the students will then always practice it, whether that's um, this is what a brand is, and using that in con not only business terms, but before we even get there, always personal practical terms. We do not teach anything within our program that is not immediately practicable and relatable into their daily lives. So no legal incorporation and the death of our program, but things like understanding um, media representation, highly important, which we cover through our branding activities, for example. Okay, come on. And at the end, at, um, again, we do a series of activities on a daily basis um, because the way you build habits is through that routine, um, through that routine and through that constant adoption. So even though the lessons themselves will change, a lot of the parameters of the day-to-day -day activities will not. Um, and I can explore that a little bit more within our discussion. To keep program and quality assurance, um, we're not only having consistent check-ins with our school partners, bi-weekly phone calls with our college student mentors, and also constant communication via Slack, um, a communication tool for anyone not familiar with Slack. But we also have our own um, proprietary tech supplement specific to our program, which allows us, and it's shared with our mentors. That gives us an in-depth look at program transparency, making sure that we know lesson of what's happening, what's going on, and if anything does need to be followed up on by the organization, perhaps that's providing an extra resource, perhaps that's answering a question on the next lesson that we can follow up, as well as quality assurance. Ultimately, this is enabling us to achieve a nationwide scale, um, and which is highly important for us in solving, this, in solving the problem that we do address. Our college student mentors do come to us for four prior um, primary reasons. One, um, one of a kind entrepreneurship development community. Digging a little deeper into that, um, one of a kind specifically speaks to um, there are a lot of service learning opportunities for our college students to engage in. Um, there's, there's a ton of mentoring and tutoring activities. Um, we are the only that allows a student to dive deeper into hands-on entrepreneurship, which not only complements their studies, whether or not they're a business management grad, most of our students are not business focused. They come from all spectrums, chemistry, um, music, liberal arts, et cetera. Um, but also to take that hands-on leadership and driving social impact and change. Um, in the college change maker space, let's say, there's really only a handful of organizations that allow that experience. Other organizations you might be familiar with include Generation Citizen, Jumpstart, or Net Impact. Um, and again, there really are limited options Beyond mentoring and tutoring um, to take that additional initiative within their own community. Um, something which is very important for our model, obviously. Um, and as an entrepreneurial service learning opportunity, that also means we're giving an in-depth leadership experience to our college students as well. So we don't expect our students to be perfect, but we do come in, we train them very hard, we support them on bi-weekly communication, and we hold them to high standards to constantly improve um, along, uh, amongst, amongst a, a large depth of skills that we hold them accountable to um, and work with them on. But this is also a leadership experience for our college students as well. Lastly, community. Um, a number of our students do remark that um, not only is it great to get to know another student on our campus who shares the same passion for the same cause that they do, but also our students are able to meet other individuals in their very own city and across the nation that are, that are involved in our programs. We do have programming presence within New York City, Boston, LA, and Oakland. So we do have a number of opportunities for students to get to know each other, especially if we do know that you have the same study or the same interest or the same um, initiative that you're trying to drive. Um, we'll connect you with those students as well. Um, so we do have plenty of students that have said, you know what, I'm involved in this um, mentoring program on campus that's specific to um, actually in Boston, young women and young girls, but this organization doesn't do what I think it should do for the community I'm serving. I'm going to start this, 
and then connecting with others around um, that particular city in We Thrive who can help them build. Um, and then lastly, uh, and uh, Steve, if you could just pass me that, that sweater. Thank you. Um, with one of our student products. This particular student product is um, a company called Difference. And their, their barcode, which you'll see, has different colors. This group of individuals uh, want to inspire their peers that you're never too young to make a difference. Um, this is a particular group of 13-year-olds 13, uh, 13 in Boston. And that's, this is more or less the exact um, type of initiative type of community thought that our students, student participants carry with them as well. Um, our program is not particularly social entrepreneurship, rather it is opportunity identification. And so it is no surprise to us that many, that sorry, most of our students do form um, nonprofits of their own within our program or things that, that do have a social focus. Um, and so with that, I will go ahead and um, conclude and dive a little deeper. Uh, this is a 30K feed of the organization, what we do and how we do it. Um, look forward to talking with Steve a little deeper into the grassroots. One thing I forgot to mention is Dave Kwan is uh, charming. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why when he was uh, at a re uh, WeWork demo day just a couple of weeks ago, he uh, pitched for what he thought was $100,000. And on the spot, he won. And they said, we're so inspired by your work that we upped it to $180,000. Wow. Thank you. Wow. So I hope you guys were as inspired as they were today by his conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but I also want to welcome, like I said, Steve Vassar, who has over 25 years of experience that I gave you, sorry. <laughs> 25 years of experience working on behalf of black men and boys in the United States is a passionate and driven leader for mentoring. Um, as I just called it the other day, he was just on a world tour um, having a bunch of conversations with folks on the importance of mentoring young black boys in the United States. And he started his own consulting firm, Ant Strategies, a few years back. and has just been named the Campaign for Black Merit Achievement Director of Rumble Young Man Rumble. So I would love to you guys to welcome Steve Vassar. <laughs> Thank you. So, Daquan, pleasure to meet. I got to dap you up, brother. Welcome. Um, so I think I want to start this conversation with uh, a deeper dive into uh, and really, I came with three questions, yeah. you know, um, that's it. That's all I got. And then we're going to let the crowd kind of um, filter in. Um, but my first question is, take me a little, now that you have shared the overall um, vehicle, right? You've shown us the business, you know, that kind of thing. I want you to take me a step deeper into what we're not seeing. And this first question is really a why question. Um, so why was it so important from that young age that you then um, pushed into this model? And why does it matter at this stage of the game? The real, oh, yeah. by the way, not the good answer, but the real answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. Um, yeah, so the reason why I think um, it was so important to me personally, um, you know, I just grew up um, within the struggle, you know, so growing up with my mom, um, where we practically grew up together in a lot of ways, um, saw that, um, you know, there's just a lot of things that she just worked so hard, um, and that as hard as she worked, somehow things just weren't moving. Um, and at a young age, you know, 13, 14 years old, um, I realized, you know, there's, it's because there's, there's nothing she can, there's not much she can do within, um, within her range. Um, she's working as hard as she could, um, held good jobs as well, but um, as a single parent mother. Um, and, and I saw a lot of the ways that, um, that society as a whole um, had barriers for us, right? Just um, things like coming to class, 11th grade, um, having been on the honor roll since 7th grade because uh, my mom would not allow otherwise, um, and getting an A on that first test and a, a teacher being surprised, right? Um, things like that um, were always in my and my mental. Um, I was always observant and aware um, and, and never 
at all satisfied. Um, and so when I was 14, when I had kind of a, a moment, one moment where I was like, wow, this is like, this is crazy. You know, my mom is doing everything she can do. Um, but still nothing, nothing can move. I think that was the moment for me personally um, where I knew I would be doing something, um, whether it be activism, social entrepreneurship, something particularly um, for my community. Um, and so that's really what it came down to is just um, not only seeing my personal um, struggle within that, but even my friends, mm -hmm. right? So um, I was really fortunate actually to have such a hardworking mother um, and, and my mom to not take anything less than the honor roll. Um, I, think, I think that was definitely something that um, is the reason I'm here, right? Is that I, I had a hard working mother that I was able to observe from, right? So part of what I mentioned earlier, right? I had a practice um, within, uh, um, <laughs> I had a mom who gave me that practice, taught me what it means to work hard, what it means to persevere. Um, and I think that was very unique. And, and all of what led me to be here, um, that's, that's the core of the why is just, Really having that unsatisfied, uh, that unsatisfied, as, that that dissatisfaction um, with the way things were, and experiencing it for myself, and and just hating it, having that chip on my shoulder. So uh, then translate that why and transfer. I think I see it, but I, I want you to yeah. say it out loud for me, so I'm not guessing, creating my own story. Of course. Um, Translate for me the why relative to the young people and that setup in the mentoring um, and actually how you've constructed this, you know, We Thrive. Yeah. So how does your why look or play out in We Thrive? Yeah, so really what, what We Thrive is, and sorry to sound like a bee in box, but uh, it, it comes down to that practice, right? It comes down to um, understanding the, so not to get too technical, but looking at um, within our demographic, and that's specifically achievement gap and opportunity gap, um, what are the things that, for our population, provide them with the skills, the opportunities, and the resources um, that are going to allow them, in a, in a self-agent way, to close that? Um, within our program, there's a lot of ways to address that. Within our program, we attack it from that individual's um, own internal capacity, um, and which which is never the full the full comprehension that can never be for that particular problem. Um, but attacking from that student self-agency and then approaching that why from, again, um, understanding the ways that that student may um, already be discouraged, um, oppressed, um, attacking it from, well, this is how you might go ahead and find your own mentor. Something within our program, I think we're, the, again, can't focus, can't focus enough on that our core is mentorship. Um, and entrepreneurship is really just a project-based learning just to learn the skills, um, which... Uh, because we do um, reside within an entrepreneurship education space, it's very easy to get distracted by, especially because our students all do create companies um, and earn real revenues. But um, at the core of it is mentorship. But we, we'd like to go a step further and say, what does it look like for the student to find their own mentor? Because that's how you, and that's how you train internal capacity. That student goes on, and when they get into college, they get into career, they're still able to do the same thing. Um, something that many of us in, the, in this room know how hard it can be to find your own mentor. Um, and definitely training that most do not get underprivileged or privileged. Um, and so really it comes down to that training mm -hmm. um, and translating not only just that training, but also that guidance, that leadership, uh, that comfort, and that support system, which is why we also emphasize just as importantly support systems. So not only um, will you receive a positive, um, out, uh, sorry, well, not only receive a support system, I'm sorry, a, a mentor, but you'll also receive um, training as to what it looks like to, to manage our support system, right? What it looks like instead of to having to say, um, hey, Vanessa, you didn't bring your suppliers today and yelling at you, which is common for a lot of us as youth, um, to receive that training of saying, hey, Vanessa, you know, we were supposed to bring it today, what happened, right? And, and those are the kinds of activities um, and lessons and training that we provide on a weekly basis within our program. Um, <laughs> And again, that's, that's a little more nuance of how we do that on a daily activity, something like a silent leader activity. Um, but coming back to how we translate that, mm -hmm. it's all about that habit adoption again and turning that training, and <coughs> turning that, training that internal capacity. So I'm going to skip my second question and go right to the third, okay. which is a little bit in politic, <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to polite it up for you. All right. <laughs> so I noticed, I observed that... Um, you made a, a um, this two-generational strategy yeah. 
yeah. that you've employed in mentoring, near peer mentoring is what you've decided to go with. And I guess my question is, um, it originally was going to be why, why foe, but it's not. It is how did you land in that space as opposed to saying, well, let me, you know, in the traditional route, um, traditional mentoring would have you going to a from a young person to an adult or to some kind of elder. Um, so how did you land in the near peer space as opposed to the a traditional route? Yeah, so um, three things. One, I had an amazing near peer mentor. Um, I was on a track team. Um, I was on a track team in high, really through all of my life, but mainly in high school where I had um, an individual who had, who had went to college um, and was probably about five or six years ahead of me, um, and he was an amazing mentor. So that's one part of it is that I have personally experienced a difference between um, a local professional mentor um, who can still be great, but a near peer mentor is someone who's close enough in age for me to relate to, but also further enough that I can still ask for advice. Um, that is a unique sweet spot that um, sometimes, most times, local professional programs don't always provide, um, particularly when you're talking about middle school students. Um, in addition to that, um, I found this program in college, right? So I was a college student, and I was able to, and the, the key thing that we, that we do within our program is just constant improvement um, and consistent data and understanding what's working, what's not, which is the main driver for also why we implemented that tech supplement, is to be able to see that, get that internal feedback. Um, and in our early days, we talked with our students what was working and what wasn't. And it was overwhelmingly clear um, that as college students, we brought a unique um, kind of chill factor and rela relaxation, right? Um, one of the, and, and just the chief among that, um, you know, one of the things that we bring in our program and we even train our students on is this is a mentoring space, right? So things like um, we don't ask our students to take our hats off in our program um, or to take their hoodies down. Um, one, because this is a, re uh, a relaxation environment. But two, we want our students to feel comfortable to be themselves and know that they're, they're already doing something amazing building a company, which most students, privileged or underprivileged, aren't doing at their age. Um, but also, we don't want to say, yeah, you know, you're doing this amazing thing building a company, but you, know, you still got that hat on. So you know, it's, not, it's, it's invalidated, um, which is the subtle message that we would be sending. Um, so Dope. that's why near peer mentors, because they can implement that effectively. I have about 80 different comments to that, but I'm going to reserve those for later. Um, we'd love to, you know, get some feedback and some thoughts from the audience, some questions from uh, our colleagues in the room. And if there are some, Akara, uh, um, coming in online, we'll take those as well. But any questions for, um, for Daquan? Yes. Um, first of all, I think this is awesome. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I think maybe this is kind of a question for, for both of you because you have a little bit of different perspectives. But uh, I love the idea of, of near peer and local because it's actionable um, and it's consistent. How do you also integrate um, mentorship and, and really kind of look people, young kids looking up to more central figures, whether it's politicians or entertainers or athletes or musicians, whatever it may be, um, sort of central iconic figures? Is there a way to sort of embed mentorship and, and looking up to people with sort of a local flavor as well? I would say that um, for us, it's all embedded within. So yes, I think so. But for us personally, it's all within purpose, right? Um, and so within our, within our program, within our branding activity, we have our students do just that, understand you know, who who within my um, who who do I see personally? Uh, because we do a brief, very brief media representation workshop within that branding to understand branding, right? Always keeping it practical and actionable. Um, and so I think within media representation specifically, that that is highly um, relevant, important for me personally as a child to be able to see someone who looks like me in a position that I want to achieve. Um, outside of that, um, in terms of practice, I think there are a lot of ways to do so. Um, and I, that, I'll kind of leave that open-ended, um, just because that, that does extend outside of our program. But I do think there's a place for that, um, but that we don't explore. So I want to be able to touch too deep on it. So real mentoring is local. The truth and the fact of the matter is that it's a relationship, is that it's a relationship that's over a long period of time. And, um, and again, I've, I've become a little more, I mean, there's a little bit of a challenge that we're in where young people are actually choosing their mentors. So they might choose somebody to aspire to be. I want to be like Al when I grow up, or I want to be like 
Daquan when I grow up, right? And Daquan could be across the country or up the street. But if I don't have a relationship with Daquan, direct relationship where he and I are talking about how do I, and he's helping me navigate, then it's not a real, you know, it's not real mentoring. It, there's something else. And I don't know what the brand is on that, but that's not mentoring. Um, the mentoring is at least a year long. Um, it is at least several hours a week um, in, in terms of what we know works. It is um, the longer the relationship, the stronger the relationship, the better the outcomes, not just on the young person, but on the mentor as well, which is another thing that's not talked about. People tend to come in, you know, with the cape and the, you know, spandex, leave, your, leave that to your imagination, and they think that it's about the young person that's in the relationship, not realizing that their life is being shaped as well. Um, and so my response to that is, and I've, I've seen programs that have tried to match mentees with, um, with high profile individuals or, or even high net worth individuals that didn't have time. Uh, and the reality is, um, as you probably know, and I'll say this as no longer a young person, that young people today have about seven seconds to give you. Seven. And if you aren't connected in those seven seconds, they're off to the next. Literally. And so that means looking people in the face and doing some consistent growing and building with them over time, as opposed to um, doing things through the technology. It actually doesn't work as well as we think. Yes. Two quick questions. Um, can you say more about how you connect to the, to the middle school and to the relationship with schools, I think it is, mm -hmm. to do that? And then what is the gender breakdown in terms of the uh, young people and then the less younger people and the mentors? <laughs> less <laughs> younger. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the less younger people. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so, um, with regards to how we specifically connect to our school partners? Yeah. Um, What's it, like, how, do, how do you find them, and why do they choose you, and how's that looked so far? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so standard outreach, um, we, do, we do have um, an, a, a, an automated way that we copy from a lot of tech companies. So we use marketing automation specifically mm -hmm. to outreach to our students, um, sorry, our school partners. Mm -hmm. um, so without going too much into the nuts and bolts, um, keeps it very efficient. Um, make sure that program coordinator is doing the most effective things. Um, diving a little deeper into why um, all of our school partners um, care most about the mentorship. Um, and one of the findings that we have discovered personally for ourselves um, is where mentorship takes, uh, takes place. Mentorship typically takes place, um, as I said, locally, of course, um, but that often means within housing authorities, local community centers, or that mentoring organization's own facilities. Um, it is more rare for mentorship to take place within the school itself if the school does not arrange for it. Um, so that's been a, a key value that we've been able to provide to a lot of our school partners. Is it public schools mainly, or public schools and charter schools, um, mostly Title Ones, um, and we do have some charters. Yes, but that's the that's the key thing that all of our school partners come for is um, the mentorship piece, and then they understand the value of the project based learning. Mm -hmm. And then with regard to the breakdown. Um, Amongst our youth participants, we do see um, a near even split um, between um, boys and girls, nothing overwhelming. Um, within our mentoring, we do have to do very, very intentional recruiting to attract um, the guys, the guy mentors of um, our program. So that's something that's very important to us is making sure that there is a student um, within our program that has a mentor they can connect to and relate to. Um, and that is more lopsided towards um, our women mentors as well. Can you talk about how you find them? How you find how the, the college students get involved? Yeah, so. Because um, I just want to, just a second like, add on question. Because both of your populations are constantly aging out like every mm -hmm. two years at, at most, right? Mm -hmm. um, and even right now, like you're a near peer to the college students, right? And mm -hmm. as you. As you age, also and get further from that, like there's potentially also another sort of disconnect that happens. So, yeah, yeah. The, the pipelines and then the future of that pipeline. I'm curious about. Yeah, so um, <laughs> pipelines on recruitment, uh, we do do intentional recruiting to partner with um, specific um, cultural affinity groups. So, for example, um, in LA, where 
we have a large uh, Latinx population. Uh, we will partner with UCLA and USC's direct Hispanic and business association, right? So, and we'll do a lot of that across different campuses to make sure that um, we do have the students that can um, fill, like mentors for our population. Um, and that's just one example. Um, within that disconnect, that's something that we're just recruiting all year round on. So anyone watching, if you're a college student, um, <laughs> get in touch. Um, and so we're recruiting all year round with that. Um, that disconnect um, isn't as major a disconnect just because it's a mentoring relationship, right? And so that student does leave with a mentoring relationship and a mentor. Um, and with regards, however, to continuity, right, um, of making sure that we have one mentor now, but what about for next program or for future mentors? Um, most of our students come in as freshmen or sophomores. By the time you are a junior or senior, you pretty much have your own activities locked down, you have your interests locked down. So that's been something good for our organization to grow with, is that um, particularly in this stage as well, um, because we're growing, our college, our college to the mentors are making their initiative their own, which is now something that they're carrying forward with that energy, that passion, attracting new mentors. So um, we have our students so far for three years and counting, um, and that's that continues to be the case that we're attracting freshmen and sophomores, mostly, not only. Yes. Um, what is your sustainability model? Do you just ask for funding from other people? Are you looking at the city for funding for your after school programs? Do you invest in your young people and then get a percentage back? Yeah. Show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we. <laughs> yeah, so um, nonprofit, 501c3, um, primary philanthropic donations. Um, we, as we continue to scale and grow, um, we are looking at a few opportunities for earned revenues, one of which is not um, necessarily counting and depending on our, on our student ventures to bring that back. So when we give that, that money to our students, it is a, a grant. Um, we give them $600 each um, and operate on a lean startup model. Um, and our students actually, with their profits, do donate. Um, sorry, do donate to a local charity of their choice in their own community. So they're going through the process of understanding what's important to me, who does that in our own community, and then going through the process to reach out, similar to how they do in the suppliers, reach out, communicate, and arrange for that donation to be had as well. Um, and so that's what happens with the money as well. But for right now, we are purely philanthropic donations, targeting foundations, having no donors. Um, not as much city, city or government funding, um, more so within um, foundations to hide network. And, and how are you going to sustain that? Was the other, that was the real question. Yeah, so within sustainability, um, we, we are targeting, again, um, at a threshold of scale, looking at the earned revenue opportunities that become available there. Um, once, for example, when we have a certain threshold of college students, a certain threshold of school partners, a certain threshold of um, middle school and high school students, what opportunities then become possible there? We don't believe in necessarily charging our schools. Um, one, because we don't believe it's a sustainable model. It, it can help support, yes, but not necessarily cover our budget. Um, and so more importantly, just looking at what opportunities become available at that scale threshold instead um, are what we're looking at, but we don't have an answer for yet. Okay. Yes. Um, so yeah, congratulations, like everyone said. My difficult question is, what has been your biggest failure, and what did you learn from that failure? Um, that's always the hardest question for me. I should start um, saving up some answers for that one. <laughs> <laughs> or like, it doesn't have to be the biggest, but something that happened that made you feel like, oh my god, I'm going to quit, but then you didn't. <laughs> um, I have to be honest and say that in that criteria, since I started we thrive, there's been nothing. Of, oh my God, I'm going to quit. Um, just because, as I mentioned, you know, I've had this in my mind for probably eight or seven, eight or nine years before I actually um, made We Thrive into an official program. Um, I went through the hard stuff already, too, at college, which was just um, putting together my own mentors, finding my own school partner, um, and doing everything that our tribal leaders have to do actually to build We Thrive. Um, so by the time I built We Thrive, there really um, isn't anything where I'm ever like, oh, this sucks, and so I'm going to stop. Um, but there are a lot of things where it's like, damn, like, I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, and things, things like that are. You know, um, I'm, I'm very, very fast-moving, fast, uh, 
very ambitious in what I'm doing. So a lot of things and making sure that like that they're ambitious, but also within line. Um, so that might have been one of my greatest failures is uh, along the way, just really going um, really fast. So greatest learning is process. Going process, fast has process and systems. And systems. Yeah, it's yeah. just me, me over there was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other, other questions, yes. Yeah, sure. How do you talk about how you are evaluating your impact? Um, talk a little bit about what success looks like for you. Yeah, so impact is super important for us, especially because in our space of entrepreneurship education, there are um, no in-depth impact metrics outside of graduation. Um, for us, graduation rates are the sum of a lot of different components to be able to attribute that to us. Um, and so we dive a little deeper into impact and prioritize five metrics. Um, one is, does our student have a mentor upon graduation, um, which we're just using tools from the Boys and Girls Club, um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters to evaluate. Um, very similar for support system, doing the same thing. Um, and then three um, evaluations on um, heart, uh, perseverance, self-esteem, self-agency, um, all of which we've worked with um, a social impact firm um, to, to devise. They themselves have looked deeper into finding the tools for us that have already been validated um, across our age demographic and for our population. Um, and so that's how we define impact is according to those five KPIs. Most importantly, do they have a mentor and support system, but also how they improve the self-esteem, self-agency, and, and ability to persevere as well, which we track through pre-surveys and post-surveys. Yeah, so our students, yeah, no worries. Um, so our students never form companies by themselves um, and always up to groups of five students um, at the most. And um, that's kind of just a micro. And then we allow them to just divvy it up um, depending on. Yes. I just have you follow up though. Yeah. So in the microcosm of the five students, I've noticed this in a lot of different occasions. How do you make sure that there aren't like two students that take over and become like the alpha? Do you, do you yeah, without a doubt. Pay attention to that, so. so, no, of course. So, um, there are a lot of ways that we go about it, and there's a few different, and so this comes into our mentor training, okay. right? And so, for our mentors, um, and a lot of this as well has been informed, in fact, by our very own mentors um, within that, that group um, building exercise for the company. Um, one of the key things that we'll do is, we'll, if we'll see that, we'll actually dictate roles per session, okay. right? And so, um, if we see there's two students that might perhaps take the most leave from one student, then we'll cycle the role of a CEO, cycle the role of the role of a CMO. Um, and so that, that allows a few things. Not only does it allow one central leader perhaps to take the role um, where they might not have, but it also allows everyone to take their own initiative on a role that would otherwise be untouched during the session as well. What's your plan for growth? Are you expanding to new cities? Are you going to take over Boston, New York, Oakland first? What does that look like? Yeah, so as of right now, we're primarily focused on making sure that everything that we have proves to be um, as impactful as we want it to be, right? Um, and so it's all about making sure that systems are just airtight, um, that everything that we have going on with the mentor training, mentor support is airtight. Um, and we're seeing a lot of indicators for what's working, but also to have indicators for what can be improved. Um, regarding new cities, we are looking at um, two new cities that aren't confirmed, but um, if we were there, we would only be within two schools. Um, anytime we expand to a new school, we only work with 15 students. The nature of working with schools means that we need to learn what works well for your school particularly. We don't want to just give you this cookie cutter program. Um, and so we cap it at 15 students in the first year. Um, and so if we do expand to two um, new cities, then that would be the case. But otherwise, we're staying present um, and focused on our four cities. All right, Cheryl. This may be a silly question. You may have talked about it earlier. Um, how did you decide those cities in the first place? Yes. And what cities did you, and can you talk a little bit about which universities and middle schools that you currently have in the pipeline? That's what the title to that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, again, our, our, current, our current cities are New York City, Boston, L.A., and Oakland. Um, we chose the cities based on um, not only need, so looking at the demographic of students, um, and particularly we looked at number of Title I schools. Um, so that was a key indicator for us to make sure that not only do we have the population, but 
um, for us as an organization, and easy access to the population. Um, within, and so Title I schools allow that, especially as a free program, uh, we can be guaranteed that we are serving our demographic of students. Um, now, even deeper in that, of choosing those particular four cities, um, they also have a high concentration um, in particular schools that we wanted to partner with as well that had the resources we would need to be successful as well. So one is the resources to be successful on our school partner side, the other is the resources to be successful on our school mentor side. So that's presence of social justice programs, presence of and prioritization as well of volunteer service departments. So things like Mills College. Um, in Boston, we have BU, Simmons College, um, Northeastern. And in New York City, we have Columbia, Fordham University, um, and Brooklyn College as well. And so also making sure that we're maintaining the hyper-local presence with schools that we will be successful with um, is, is kind of that long story short. Um, I just want to make sure I answered your attack on question. OK. Sure. This is sort of a segue to all of these questions. So you, there's sort of a fork in the road where you could have um, decided to go deep in a particular city, build that model before expanding, but yep. you sort of decided on the spread model instead. And there are trade-offs. I mean, there's no right answer. Why did you decide to start in a number of cities versus like anchoring down in Boston, going deep, and then expanding? Yeah, so um, if I'm being honest, um, <laughs> 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 if I'm being honest, um, I started off in Boston, um, and um, Boston was an incredibly impressive city for myself as um, an entrepreneur of color. Um, when I particularly had left, um, I spoke with um, a person that I won't name, actually. Um, <laughs> really? You just going to leave us hanging? This is my honesty. No. But <laughs> <laughs> I had spoken with a person who won't be named. Um, <laughs> And um, they had informed me there were no VCs of color in the city at the time. This, this was in 2014. Um, and, and so that's the, that's the layer of, um, of what, what, I, what I was battling with. And on top of that, um, there were tons of entrepreneurship education initiatives oversaturating Boston. Um, and so um, my assumption and belief, um, which I feel like has been proven true, was that um, we would continue to grow at the same pace in Boston that I would if I was there or not. And so where might we thrive be that might better leverage and obtain the resources we need in our foundation as an organization um, that we can scale with? And, um, and so that was a part that I left out my last question. Um, that is also a part of the reason that I looked at those particular four cities, is that um, not only the resources of partners and mentors, but also for an organization. Um, not only things like funding, but partners. Right? And so um, there's a lot to be said as well of the individual organizations that we'll partner with in each city um, to make that happen, key of which are citizen schools in Boston, actually. Um, thanks to that citizen school partnership, we're actually going to be scaling through a bunch of citizen schools in our current cities um, this year. And that's another part um, that's proved to be um, the same exact as if we acquire our own new schools, but easier management, et cetera. Um, and so more, more specifically, that's why we chose, is because um, in Boston specifically, it was clear we were going to grow at the same pace um, and still be able to leverage the same exact resources, um, if not more, to be honest, out being outside of it because, because I didn't have that constant dream. Um, and two, um, those particular cities gave us initial presence. Again, we weren't doing an aggressive expansion by any means into those cities, but just presence enough to be able to showcase um, what we're doing in cities to prove impact. Yes. Um, could you talk a little bit about your employees, like how many you have and what's your organizational structure if you're putting in place? Yeah, so small team, um, two people. Um, we do highly leverage virtual assistants. So, um, <laughs> and tip notes. Um, <laughs> and so we, so for, for example, things like um, social media, um, not at all important um, up until now. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, not important up until now. Um, and so we're now hiring for actually two new roles um, for a marketing manager and a business development manager. That business development manager does encompass a lot of our development work. Um, so that's another um, outlet. If you do know of anyone, please do put me in touch as well, um, specifically. Um, and so that, those, are, those are our team. We do 
an amazing job with our virtual assistants that have been with us for a while now um, and are able to leverage a lot of those um, smaller tasks that the team doesn't have to deal with, right? So things like um, outreach to school partners um, and data entry of school partners um, aren't necessary for an internal staff to do uh, that will leverage um, our virtual team with. Yeah, so that's one of the other things that we've experimented in power with it as well. Um, and we've, we've, again, we're all about data improvement, data and improvement and understanding what's working, what's not. Um, and so from the beginning, we've always tried mentor confidence surveys um, and mentor preparation surveys, just simple things that we found online, nothing that we would have um, felt the need to recreate ourselves. Um, and so we do do um, Google training, Google Hangout training um, amongst our demographic of students, which also allows us to pair them up with other students around the nation um, at the same time. And so that's also very important for us in our mission as well, and building that community of students who are not just um, working towards a mission, but working towards a mission as a collective. Um, we do prioritize for you to work alongside individuals at your own school, in your own city, um, but also important to connect that group, in which Google Hangout allows us to do, but also that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, there's nothing that we wouldn't cover in person that we wouldn't cover Google Hangout as well. And especially for college students, most of our trainings are at 8 p.m. at night as well. Um, and so it's also um, a perfect blend as well for their personal work-life balance, where they typically can't really make a typical training, um, first of all, in the morning, to um, <laughs> 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. as well. Yeah, um, and uh, so as we're sort of wrapping up, we'd love to hear any final thoughts that you have. Um, and uh, Dequan, um, uh, what do you want to ask this audience to do? What, what sort of help do you need? What can we do to support you? What's your call to action for us? Cool. Um, it's funny, I'm laughing because there's always money, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but more specifically. Got a hat around the corner. I'll bring it there. <laughs> we'll be bringing a hat around. Uh, so like, <laughs> um, but more seriously, um, for, for us within um, this time period, it's all about um, foundation. Um, our philosophy is building from that foundation. A part of that foundation that I'll speak on specifically is on our community, our supporters. Um, Echo and Green has been an amazing supporter for that. Um, thanks again for that. Probably say that every time I'm here, but th always thanks. Um, but that also includes our local professionals. Um, we are looking at opportunities for our local professionals to be involved within that mentoring, specifically of our college students. Um, it is something that at a micro micro level um, we are experimenting with. So um, I love to first invite anyone here to be involved with the organization on that micro level. Um, if you are involved with that, um, if you are interested in that, please do come speak to me afterwards um, or for a business card and we definitely will follow up with you. Um, and you know, yeah, we'll pass around the collections. And um, <laughs> feel free to also put your card in there for, um, for local professional interest. <laughs> The money first, and then the card. <laughs> All right. Um, so no, no. I just want to thank you. Um, thank you. I got everything that I needed to get because one of my other questions coming in that I don't ask you, but um, I always ask, and and Melanie, uh, Melinda knows this question very well from um, Susan Taylor, which is what is what should I be learning from you? You know, so I'm always hoping to come into a room and learn from a, a young person, and certainly you've provided that. So I appreciate that personally. And also, um, thank you on behalf of, of the crowd. So let's give Daquan a warm round of applause. Thank you. thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We hope that you have enjoyed the conversation. And one more round of applause for Steve. <laughs> Now back as a moderator for Upstart. So look at how the world works. Um, so we hope you get some breakfast and uh, donate to Dayquan. That's right. That's right. Uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.